Oh, kia ora koto. Good morning, good afternoon or good evening to you all. Welcome to New Frontiers Digital. This session is organised by the Edmund Hillary Fellowship as part of our New Frontiers series of online events. It's a modification of our normal three-day conference that's held in New Zealand. We run these events to showcase leading thinking from EHF fellows and aim to provide accessible, inspiring ideas that can support action. So before we get started, a few housekeeping rules. Any technical issues, put them in the chat window. Post questions for Danny, Debbie or Amrit, our panelists in the Q&A section. And we'll be recording this session and it'll be available afterwards on our website. And that applications for cohort eight are closing on the 1st of June. So you can actually put those applications in. So just a reminder, today's session, it's insights from the investment landscape in Asia. And our panelists today, we have got Danny Lee, we've got Devi Lil, and we've got Emirates. And we each panelist is going to speak for 10 minutes, and they will um, then we'll follow that with Q and A for 20 minutes. So I'll get each speaker to introduce themselves, and then Danny is going to touch on the latest venture and PE investing trends in Asia, family office view on capital deployment during this period. And then Danny's role in Elevate and how that aims to help develop the New Zealand early stage investing ecosystem. Take it away, Danny. Right. Thanks. Um, so uh, my name is Danny Lee. I am uh, an EHF fellow. I'm cohort three. Uh, I'm based in Hong Kong and uh, I run the direct investment business for uh, a family office here. Uh, and I've been kind of investing in globally for over 20 years now, both uh, in VC, growth capital, as well as buy it out. So um, what I'll talk about first is probably give people a overview on the, some of the latest trends that's happening uh, in the venture capital and the, in private equity market globally, um, particularly in Asia as well. Um, in general, I would say, you know, activities, investing activities have generally slowed down um, since beginning of the year. Um, the impact is quite a bit deeper and broader felt. Um, this is actually different from 2008. So a lot of people kind of think about, oh, how this is compared to the great financial crisis. Um, the situation that's driving this is very different from 2008. It's, it's broader. Um, and uh, we think the, the markets are, the, the stock markets in general, if you look at the stock market performance has been greatly exaggerated. We actually think the, there's a lot more risk uh, in the global economy to come. Um, but having said that though, um, there is still a lot of uh, capital in both venture capital and private equity globally uh, because lots of the funds have raised a lot of money. So we, we are still relatively awash in liquidity. Um, just a lot of people are holding back. Uh, in terms of kind of uh, looking at the different type of opportunities, um, there's really a tale of two cities, if you will. Um, strong companies today are still able to raise money um, and continue to drive high, high evaluations, you can see. Uh, but there's a large number of smaller companies where the business model is less proven, where the company is probably not yet profitable. Uh, they are facing much more scrutiny from investors, uh, valuations coming down. Um, there's a, quite a few down rounds that we see uh, in the, the region. Um, and actually, that's a, probably a fact globally as well. People who could raise money are scrambling to raise money to, uh, um, to have enough cash to make sure they survive this winter, which people are looking at at least 12, if not 18 months. Um, and you have a little bit of a, a, a vision fund, back, if you will, in the venture capital space. Uh, we all know the SoftBank vision fund have drove a lot of the unicorn valuations uh, because of what's happening to them and to the global markets. Looks like they won't be able to raise a fund too. And uh, a lot of companies that are you know, driven up into very high valuations will have a pretty big down round in this situation and that will have big impacts on their ESOP pools on, on management share. So it could, those companies could go into a bigger problems than, than we can all realize. Uh, and then I, I would say lastly, uh, on, the, on the market front, there are a few business models that are thriving and there are a few business models that are not or industries that are not. I would say in general, online uh, business models, healthcare, sustainable slash ESG type of businesses are being more sought after. Uh, people are really looking at those, um, given that some of these businesses actually have benefited uh, 
from the COVID uh, experience. Uh, industries such as real estate, education, travel and hospitality are clearly being hit. Uh, and a lot of these models are now being reconsidered. Uh, in particular, I think the, the low rate situation uh, has really impacted um, real estate and a lot of the investment decisions. And people are quite honestly still having a wait and see attitude uh, in terms of how that will all play out. I will give you some numbers as well on, the, on the, my second point about how some of the family offices and, and general investors are thinking about uh, how they're looking at this whole capital deployment uh, during this period. Um, we have a, a quick survey that we did with some of the uh, largest uh, well-known family offices in the world. And here's some statistics I could share. Um, roughly only about less than 20% of the people believe that the economy, the global economy, will recover in 2020. Uh, roughly half the people think that the recovery will probably happen sometime in 2001. So this is not a short-term thing for sure. Um, and about less than a third uh, think it actually might take longer than that. It might go beyond 2020. Um, so in general, I would say people are kind of thinking about the long term and, and expecting this to go longer rather than shorter. Um, in terms of making investments, roughly two thirds of the people are still making investments. So as I mentioned before, people still have liquidity uh, and they're still making investments. About the other one third is taking a way and see attitude and holding back uh, in terms of making new investments. A lot of people are focusing on the existing portfolios, trying to fix things up. Um, in terms of investment strategy, about 75% of the people are not significantly shifting their strategy because of what's happened. They are maintaining their allocations, they're maintaining their strategic focus, the industry focus, geographic focus, et cetera. Um, the rest would say it's probably too early to say, but they are thinking about uh, some changes maybe in the six to 12 month time frame. Uh, but in general, most people are open for business, uh, if you will. Um, Investments still being being done. It's just a lot slower pace, and the terms are being readjusted. Uh, we're starting to see some of the terms with venture capital uh, starting to become a bit more uh, investor friendly versus before. Um, the greatest concern that people have is the hit of a second wave. Um, this year is pretty much a write off for most people, uh, with the exception of perhaps some of the Chinese investors who sees a uh, a slightly brighter outlook in China. But in general, I think um, people are really concerned about the second, maybe even the third wave hitting uh, if the markets are open too quickly. And then lastly, I will talk about uh, my role here uh, in New Zealand and, and relative to, uh, to Elevate. Um, so in times like this, um, I think we really try our best to step up and help smaller and less mature companies and ecosystem to survive and to develop more. Um, Elevate is basically, think of it as a fund of, fund of venture funds uh, that are sponsored by the New Zealand government. Uh, we have about 300 million New Zealand dollars uh, with the goal is to fill uh, a funding gap uh, in New Zealand, uh, basically for venture capital. Um, there is a shortage of funding from what we can see, usually around series A and B stage in New Zealand. There is a uh, relatively thriving C, uh, early, very early stage angel round investors uh, in New Zealand that can start companies. Um, and you can see also there are mature uh, funds that come in through Australia to invest into uh, New Zealand companies as well. But in the middle, there is a gap. Um, and what, what a lot of companies need is that development capital, usually at the A and B stage, to take them through from concept to develop the business model to prove and to scale up to a certain point. And that's what Elevate is trying to do. Um, the, the things that we're looking for uh, in this is to find managers um, that will have one, a good track record that includes obviously, you know, your, your uh, investment performance, uh, having a stable team with some scale. Um, and then second thing we look at is the value add that uh, these managers will have um, to New Zealand, whether or not they have, they're focusing on the right stage. So we're looking for people who are doing more serious A and B uh, stage work. Uh, whether or not they have a dedicated fund pool to New Zealand, either if you know, they're New Zealand based or if they're not, they should have very uh, clear dedication of time and resources and people and fund size to invest into New Zealand and help develop the ecosystem. Uh, and lastly, we look for you know, alignment of interests uh, because we'll be investors uh, uh, kind of um, starting LPs into these funds. 
we look for alignment of interest in the sense that we expect the investors themselves, the general partners, to make commitment into the fund themselves. Um, so that's a quick summary of what I have to discover. I'll turn the mic over. Thanks. Thanks, Danny. That was great. So now we're going to have our next speaker, our guest speaker, Debbie. And Debbie's going to take us through uh, these few points. What's the Asian LP's recent reaction to the markets and plans for capital deployment? How the US and European GPs are reacting to the current environment of travel restrictions, i.e. delaying and or extending fundraisers? And does the world need another first time fund, whether it's VC, growth, capital or buyout? Um, if you're raising your own fund, what are some of the key points to address? Thanks, Dewey. Great. Hi. Hello, everyone. I'm Debbie. It's good to be here. Um, so the, the topic covers, especially the first general piece, a little bit of that actually will overlap with what Danny shared. Um, but I'll try to focus more on the institutional side of the LP world. Um, so what I do for work is I, I fundraise um, full time for a variety of different private funds. So from strategies like private equity buyouts to growth capital, venture capital, credit funds, infrastructure, etc. Um, and we primarily work with a broad segment of institutional LPs, including sovereign wealth funds, asset managers, insurance companies, and then larger family offices. So Danny is not only a friend, but also uh, one of the LPs that we cover. Um, so what we have seen in the past, I would say, four to five months, given the market downturn and the volatility, is exactly kind of what uh, Danny touched on. Um, and I, I would uh, kind of roughly uh, categorize LPs into two camps. One is the more sophisticated and experienced LPs, um, so those that have gone through cycles, they understand that you can't, um, you can't completely stop your private um, investing program right now. Um, generally, a lot of the LPs we're talking to are, are saying that they understand in a downturn some of the best returns occur if you can find the right managers, right? Um, What's happening is people are slowing down, partially because there's you know, working at home and the challenges of getting the IC together to discuss, um, uh, uh, to discuss due diligence or discuss fund recommendations. But generally we are seeing the more sophisticated LPs still saying they want to and they have to uh, deploy capital into funds across different private strategies. Um, I think within that, we've also looked at some research. Uh, so during 2000, uh, nine vintage funds, they actually were some of the best returning funds. So 2009 funds had a net IRR of 13% across private equity. And then if you compare it to 2006 vintage funds, that was about 8.9%. So there's definitely an alpha um, if LPs uh, consistently invest into this downturn. Um, I think what's also happening right now is this, you know, the past 10 years have been relatively easy money because the markets have just been good for everybody. Um, and managers often pitch and say, you know, we're good at managing risk. We, you know, invest in strong companies, et cetera. But it's in a downturn that you really see uh, a manager's true colors, right? How are they performing in a crisis? How are their portfolio companies doing? Do they really deliver on um, the risk or the downside risk management that they were promising? Um, and Q1 valuations have started to come out. So we have seen quite a broad range of markdowns. Um, a lot of GPs or fund managers have marked down between 15 to 25%. Um, but some have actually very minor markdowns. Um, I've seen kind of 12%. And that manager really is um, continuing to close his fund and raise capital, right? Because they really are delivering on what they said. Um, I think LPs are also just very nervous about Q2 valuations. And that kind of goes to what Danny said is this recovery in the stock market may not reflect in underlying fundamentals. So I think a lot of LPs are waiting to see what's going to happen with Q2. So the second broad category is the more um, the LPs that are less experienced. Um, so they may not have gone through cycles before um, and their ICs are just very cautious right now. Right. So a lot of them actually have pulled back and just stopped their programs in general. Um, what they're doing instead is looking at their existing portfolios and really scrutinizing the managers that they have today. Right. So, so setting up conference calls and really asking them questions around how are you managing the risk? What's happening to your portfolio companies? Um, what are what's happening to the industries that you're investing in and et cetera? Um, but uh, yeah, like, for example, in Korea, in Malaysia, there are also different dynamics. Um, again, uh, Malaysia is a little bit because of politics and then the currency depreciation. So a lot of those LPs have just stopped their program in general and they want to see what happens. Um, Korea is 
Interestingly, culturally, they don't take as many phone calls. They would prefer to have face-to-face -face meetings. So that's also creating this dynamic of just delaying a lot of fundraisers. Um, but as the markets, the stock markets have come back, we are finding some LPs slowly, cautiously coming back uh, into the market as well. So they're taking more calls now. They do want to figure out um, which managers are good and which ones are the ones that they want to invest in. I think the other point that I would make here is for any new GPs, new being um, new to a LP's portfolio, it's going to be a very tough year to fundraise unless you really have something truly differentiating. So it could be, again, that you're very good at managing risk and you're demonstrating that now in this crisis, or you have some type of strategy or some type of sector that is very unique and you can prove that or be able to communicate that. Um, so second topic is just how are GPs reacting to this market? So we generally work with more experienced um, US and European managers that are probably fund three or fund five and etc. So, so a lot of them have gone through cycles. Um, but, you know, with global travel restrictions, everyone is also realistic, right? Um, LPs can't travel, so they can't do on-site diligence. So the GPs are also slowing down. It's like one of our clients originally thought, okay, they'll start in January, they'll be done by July. Okay, after a lot of discussion back and forth and trying to get them to be real realistic, they're doing rolling closes um, and then extending probably until December. We've also asked a number of other GPs, um, you probably want to extend till next year, because not only do we have more clarity on the, the economy, but also next year gives you a different budget from the LP side, right? So you'll actually hopefully have a little bit more fresh capital next year as well. Um, I've also seen some GPs just do smaller, quicker raises. So instead of, you know, again, past 10 years, it's been, um, you know, a good market for fundraising, right? A lot of people have been able to double their fund size or go up, you know, to plus 50% in their new fund. But what we're finding some of the experienced GPs say is, you know, let's just keep it the same size. Let's just focus on um, LPs re-upping and just get it done, right? So instead of being overly ambitious, let's just be realistic and get this fund done. So uh, I would say, again, GPs are reacting in, in, in a, a couple of those different ways. The other um, point that I would make is it's even more imperative, I think, in this downturn and crisis that um, GPs have been thinking about diversifying their LP base, whether it's across geographies or across different segments, um, because, you know, Asian LPs generally have slowed down, right? Um, US LPs, I think, generally also have slowed down. Interestingly, I heard a data point a few days ago um, from a friend in the industry who actually said Middle East LPs are continuing to deploy because despite the oil, um, uh, oil price impact, they have, uh, the, the Middle East institutional LPs actually are quite sophisticated and they have been trying to diversify away from oil and into private equity funds across different industries. So a lot of them actually will continue to deploy capital. So I thought that was an interesting point. Um, and the last uh, topic, okay, does the world need another fund? Or if you're a first time GP uh, manager, how are you going to raise capital? So one, it's going to be very difficult. First time uh, managers are always very difficult. I think in the current market, it's going to be extremely difficult. Um, unless, so just some advice, unless you really have something very, very unique and differentiated. So if you're, let's say, an early stage venture capital firm, and even within that strategy, there's hundreds, if not thousands of managers. And I get pitch books a lot, or I listen to, you know, a friend's friend introduces someone that wants to start their own venture fund, and we talk about it. But you, you really have to have some type of focus, whether it's cryptocurrency or medical devices or, you know, something that's really differentiated, especially if your fund is a bit smaller, um, which venture capital generally is, right? Venture is usually a couple hundred million. So within that, really think through, like, what do you bring that's really different? Um, the other kind of points I would add is you yourself as a manager should have very high conviction in your fund. And that usually means you really do need to put your own dollars into your fund. Um, so the industry generally, uh, in terms of GP percent of contribution, is probably 2% up to, I've seen, up to even 10%. Um, but if you're a first time manager, and you're only, let's say, putting in only 2%, and if your background and your net worth is pretty high, I don't think it's that convincing to only put in 2%, right? Again, you're first time. So you need to be able to convince LPs to be putting in millions of their dollars. And if you're not putting your own money in, it's a pretty hard story to 
uh, it's a pretty hard way to convince people. Um, and then I think uh, with portfolio companies, and then I think your pitch, you also really have to think through, um, are the companies you're investing in going to have cash flow? What is that business model? Is it resilient, right? It, uh, resilient to uh, cycles like now? Are you really delivering a customer need? Um, and we're seeing that even with the large funds like Vision Fund, which is going through a lot of issues in a lot of their portfolio companies, but even more so if you're a first time manager, how do you put together a convincing story? That's it. Brilliant. Thanks, Debbie. That's really good, actually. I've, I've got a lot of notes there on that one. So now we're going to move to our third uh, panelist, um, Amarit. He's going to take us down a slightly different path now. He's going to talk about impact investor views from Southeast Asia and Asia Pacific, uh, looking at new modes of philanthropy for corporates and family offices coming from Southeast Asia. And then also, this is one I like, how innovation is going back to research and deep tech. Take us away. Thanks, Amarit. Awesome. Yep. Uh, so coming in, and uh, I'm the uh, EHF fellow, uh, cohort one, cohort co represent. Uh, I bring a lot of my perspective from 10 years uh, running Thailand's first social, first social enterprise incubator. Uh, got into tech and co-working space, and uh, I love the mention about uh, Vision Fund. Um, we we definitely got told by a lot of uh, potential investors to. <clears throat> copy the WeWork uh, pitch deck. Uh, thankfully, we didn't do that. Um, and obviously, uh, Claim to Fame is running a, a conference uh, technology media company that has through and reads 20,000 attendees every June. But now I'm here to represent a new uh, project. Um, and it's the first time I'm mentioning it uh, as the as in director of Impact Collective, which is a community driven accelerator program and a fund that focuses on opportunities in Asia, uh, and we've been in partnership with folks like the World Federation of UN Associations, UN SCAP, and Citypreneur. So what I've really came back full circle is now to come and look at the companies in the co-working space through my media company, through my network, and say that we could look to work with about 100 promising startups in Asia Pacific over a six-month virtual acceleration program which will be anchored uh, in four cities across APAC and right now being backed by a fund of uh, five, maybe up to $10 million. So a um, small fish in this big pond of a uh, Zoom webinar, but today I'd just like to mention that as somebody who's been looking at hundreds of startups uh, annually, we're seeing three very interesting shifts that's happening in the past three months. So, Firstly, uh, Southeast Asia startups, uh, like Danny was saying, with, uh, the winners are getting a pile up of capital as uh, the riskers in the view of investors are lower and the uh, weaker ones are being uh, basically getting less access to uh, funding or just even the opportunities to, to pitch. Uh, and I think a lot of that's driven by in the past um, unsustainable business models, uh, weak financials, and uh, in many cases, a lot of uh, early stage entrepreneurs are first timers. So a lot of gaps in terms of management experience, governance, um, treasury and finance. And that's something that, you know, in, in our impact collective, we've been trying to look at to fulfill because as we try to graduate these companies and pass them on to our investment partners in the series A and A plus stage, we find that this is the often a deal breaker and then creates uh, headaches that takes you know one to two years to resolve. Uh, we're also seeing a um, hashtag pandemic pivot. I think the big question now is everybody has seen it in their ecosystem where you know a insure tech company or a home cleaning service uh, is now moving into food delivery and and all sorts of other short-term measures to bootstrap, to stay alive, stay afloat. I think we're getting into a lot of um, conversations and board meetings and understand what is the true business model going forward for the next 12 to 24 months. And, and with these pivots or kind of short-term consulting gig or, or bootstrap mode, just to bring in the cash, um, just to keep the lights on, some of these companies need to hibernate. A lot of travel companies have 
zero bookings. So, you know, do they keep the team or do they move out into different sectors? And I think that's uh, an ongoing conversation that's starting to accelerate um, as uh, a lot of investors want to know whether they should be doubling down on the team or should the team be doing something else. And also opening up new opportunities as um, in Southeast Asia, some of the biggest um, funders and investors of, of startups uh, happen to be uh, conglomerates, uh, corporate venture capital, and some family offices. So I've uh, recently been in touch with about five education institutions and they are in uh, desperate need of solutions uh, that might be coming in US or Europe, but right now people are um, you know, sending homework on uh, chat apps and having webinars and the experience is uh, abysmal. And we're seeing parents uh, literally not paying tuition and saying that they're gonna pull the kids out of school because they can't access any other facilities. So as mentioned earlier, education is an interesting space that we we're tracking, um, obviously biotech, health tech, um, that's a strong base that we see in Thailand, uh, FinTech, a lot of companies in the region are, are raising as we're going to a cashless, contactless uh, economy faster than anybody has expected. And also around uh, future work digital literacy. Uh, a lot of people that can work from home and are working from home uh, have the luxury and privilege of uh, broadband internet and the ability to use the tools that they have uh, to find opportunities. Uh, but we're seeing people that are in the retail sector tourism sector, hospitality, uh, and, and a lot of countries that are not uh, well equipped to help these people transition to more uh, sustainable jobs. So on that, on that front, um, we also find that the startups that we work with uh, on the social impact space, uh, past 10 years, um, looking at the Thai example, there's a handful of names, household names that 10 years ago you've heard of, and they're still around. But the challenge is we are also trying to see whether in the past we've been always looking for the passionate social entrepreneur that wants to change the world and trying to give them the tools of business. Nowadays, I think the market has, has broadened as, as basically jaded tech entrepreneurs also looking for both money and meaning. And there is kind of a um, convergence of impact and tech. Uh, so, a lot of the investments that we'll be looking into the entrepreneurs that we want to work with are the ones where there is a scalable business model to begin with, but then we're going to wrap impact sustainability and, and measurement around that. Uh, we also seeing a ton of great feedback from uh, an interesting source of uh, philanthropic capital and, and new family offices. So uh, nothing against you, Danny, but uh, we're seeing a lot of very uh, powerful matriarchs and, and women that are leading uh, family offices and conglomerates in Thailand uh, for some very interesting reason. We have the highest percentage of women in executive positions for uh, companies that are in the stock exchange. Um, I think over the mean about close to 35%. <coughs> and a lot of them are very much reaching out to and trying to see how they can divert some of their uh, corporate budgets, uh, especially their marketing budget and events budget that are now on hold or completely cut and shift into CSR budget this year. And they're trying to see if they could make their impact dollars go further rather than invest on a one-off um, charity or project. Uh, they're also looking at opportunities to impact on, on projects that will provide ongoing sustainable returns and, and impact. So. I think uh, without um, you know the, the support of large enterprise, which happens to be the the one of the biggest accelerant of market adoptions and scale in in the region, um, there's no doubt that you know in every country in Southeast Asia, about 10 to 20 families run the show, and then you know that's something we just have to contend with. And uh, that said, the investments that were mostly earmarked just for startups and accelerator programs and whatnot. We're also seeing a lot of them being deployed into deep tech R&D, hence to the point that three of our major banks are saying that they want to build the next unicorn. 
uh, versus another ecosystem where there's more open innovation or, or people trying to work with startups. That goes to show that these companies are, are seriously adapting the startup tools, are very much uh, attuned to what's going on, the big shift in their ecosystem and, and the critical risk that business as usual no longer works. But at the same time, there's still massive opportunities uh, for new companies uh, to work with these corporates, but uh, they no longer can you just come in and pitch uh, a marketplace or an app that has a million downloads. Uh, uh, I think one of the, the things I, I mentioned earlier is R&D um, and, and going back to unsexy business, uh, software as a service is a lot of companies move to part-time or even some uh, permanently rem remote working or working from home, like as you see with Twitter, a lot of companies are selling the digital transformation process. And if you have the tools and innovation that can help them, um, working with their legacy systems, solving some really hard problems, that's a great opportunity to, to get investment and then business and partnerships. Uh, but if uh, you're looking at just another clone from uh, a more mature market, uh, I think corporates have adjusted very well. Um, and, and I think the, the, the point is that there's a lot of uh, hidden gems and, and undervalued deals. So in, and that is why we're at Impact Collective, we're trying to uncover these deals and give them the spotlight, give them the platform, give them the market access and through our community across the region, the growth and scale. Because for an example, one company I work with, eTron, is building a fleet of electric motorcycles designed and built in Thailand. They won the Red Dot Award, they won the UN environmental program, uh, low carbon lifestyle challenge and work with two of the major conglomerates in Thailand. But, you know, across the world, nobody has heard of them and it's been very difficult to fundraise. But there are great companies like this, that, the hidden gems that just need a little bit of the advice and support that hopefully we can provide. And not only will we providing that for the companies in region, I specifically, as Part of the Impact Collective would like to also focus on New Zealand. So firstly, very soon, we're gonna be doing a pilot internally with the Edmund Hillary Fellows to see how we can help source some of the amazing projects and put them in front of great investors like Dan and Debbie and all the investor uh, fellows in the program. And if all things go well, we hopefully will open it up to Kiwi entrepreneurs. So that's my um, contribution to being part of such an amazing fellowship, Michelle. That's great. How about touching on how innovation is going back to research and deep tech? Sure. Um, so uh, we've been looking at a lot of uh, opportunities uh, where uh, in the past, uh, a lot of the startups that we've been working with have and in Thailand uh, and Southeast Asia don't really have any IP or uh, acquired technology or have any um, tech teams, uh, there, there's maybe some uh, light web development, app development teams. Um, and for a lot of the companies that we help to try to mature, uh, they get up to a stage where uh, once they meet investors, once they meet uh, potential uh, buyers, a lot of them feel that, well, there's, uh, you know, this is something that we could very much duplicate with the army of engineers, the resources, the technology, um, the technologies that we have in house. So when you go up um, and get in markets that are challenged or have a lack of private funds, um, in certain cases, uh, you know, out, any market outside of you know Singapore, Indonesia, is always going to be a challenge in fundraising at the moment, and not so more. Uh, we we're seeing a lot of companies, uh, especially like in in Thailand, they're going back to. Uh, r and their own battery technology in-house uh, and uh, looking at commercializing some of the amazing research that are coming out of university-led government labs. So uh, the big joke, I, I say I'm a mentor at the, uh, the National Science Technology Development Agency uh, R&D lab here in, in Thailand. And to be honest, the innovations that are going to come out in the next three to seven years around biotech and cosmetic and food science it's probably more exciting than a lot of the startups I see in, in pitch competitions. But the challenge is that 
uh, the research community and the commercialization office has not fully embraced um, helping the researchers uh, to become entrepreneurs. And, and in many cases, um, they're not matched with the right entrepreneurs, so they act they're actually not keen to become entrepreneurs in such a, um, you know, uh, unfavorable uh, economic climate. So I think there's a lot of work that we could be doing there. But if all things go well, and more and more universities these days that we work with would like to do that really well, um, we've been in touch with some universities in New Zealand who have a lot of experience and actually would like to partner up with the Thai government, the, the, the Thai universities. So I think uh, if that pipeline is sorted, you're going to see a lot more interesting innovations. Like we, we've got researchers who, you know, research cures for or, or uh, antiviral drugs for HIV coming out uh, of Thailand and, and made some very great progress with many cancer research. So uh, stay tuned on that. Great. That's great. Thanks. Um, Danny and Debbie, do you, the Asian funds like to invest you know, outside of market into New Zealand companies. So if the companies have had some good angel investment, they may have had their early Series A, and then they're looking and they're becoming exporting companies up into the Asian markets. How keen are the um, Asian funds to invest in these New Zealand companies? Yeah, so uh, maybe I'll take a first crack at that. Um, the the short answer is they're still fairly keen to invest uh, into that space. Um, the the issue I mentioned before is that historically, uh, a lot of those funds that are investing in these growth stage type of uh, companies, even out of New Zealand, came from outside of New Zealand. So they came from mostly probably Australia, um, some of them based in Singapore, uh, some of them based in China, maybe even Taiwan. Um, but there, there's a lack of uh, New Zealand-based investors uh, funds that are providing this kind of funding and support. Uh, and that's what Elevate is trying to adjust, uh, address. Um, we're, we're trying to you know, find these uh, investors and funds and put money to them and allow them to you know, have the firepower to help New Zealand companies uh, to take them through that stage. Because a lot of these um, funds, when they're coming from outside, the issue is, they don't have enough time and effort. Uh, they don't know the market as well. So they tend to focus on only the bigger ones and not, you know, there's a host of others that just kind of gets left out. Um, and, you know, Elevate is trying to address that by hopefully uh, putting more money on the ground and putting more uh, managers on the ground to help uh, some of these companies to give a better chance, a better shot. Mm, nice. Debbie, anything to add on that? Otherwise, I've got another question for you. Yeah, I think a couple a couple thoughts. It could just be, um, so I know that a number of the Asian GPs, um, like the, the larger ones probably that have, you know, uh, north of $500 million fund sizes, they are trying to diversify. So a number of them probably in the past looked in China, but increasingly that's very competitive. So they have shifted to also invest in Southeast Asia. And I do think they're is opportunity for New Zealand. I think it's just increasing awareness. That, that would be one piece. Um, and I think uh, secondly, a, a bit to what Danny is talking about, it's just as long as there are good companies to invest in, the capital will follow. Mm. Yeah. Nice, thank you. Um, Emma, one for you. We've got a question out there from Alan. It's about social impact investors. Uh, Woman-led businesses can be amazing, which is true. Would you have some advice for her on social impact woman-led businesses like that are scalable? Whom should she approach? Well, uh, this is for um, as a mentor or as a uh, potential investor to pitch. I'm not sure. She hasn't really said, so I'm assuming it would be for getting investment. Ah, okay. So I think there's um, a few things uh, to do before um, uh, pitching, uh, I guess. One of which is to make sure that you're finding uh, friendly mentors that can give you the, the advice and support and network. And I think for, for Danny and Debbie, uh, they're getting a gazillion uh, pitch decks and then uh, funds and, and deals and opportunities and, and there are uh, channels and sources of trusted uh, vetted uh, deal flow that are coming and that if it's coming from this person it must be legit and warrants higher attention 
And I think that uh, through the uh, Edmund Hillary Fellowship, uh, maybe our, our co-host and host, uh, you know, Paula, Michelle, you can definitely point to some uh, women uh, investors. There's one in, in Singapore, Audrey Chan is a uh, of circles of angels and, you know, beautiful soul. She, you know, she'll laugh, she'll giggle, she'll help almost anybody, but she'll also give you some very stern comments. So I think that would be uh, another Kawakawa cohort one fellow uh, that I highly recommend. Um, and obviously we, we are uh, the uh, team that is mostly running Impact Collective is that not only do we have uh, co-founders that have exited for a hundred million dollars, but more, more than half the people on the team are, are women and are all entrepreneurs. So at the Impact Collective, we're more than happy to uh, you know, stay in touch as well. So uh, give me a shout if, if you like to um, be uh, connected to us. Thanks. And Debbie, um, one for you here. I'm thinking if New Zealand um, VCs and uh, maybe some of the mid to small size sort of um, VC firms in New Zealand are raising funds, um, how interested do you think the Asian sort of market would be to invest in the actual funds themselves? I think there's, so there's always potential. Um, to be country specific, you would probably have to find one of the, one of the more uh, uh, sophisticated LPs that has a larger portfolio, right? Um, because then they, you know, but they probably invested in a lot of generalist funds, um, so they have good allocation in that space, and then a lot of a lot more experience. So they will start to look for country specific. Um, but in any case, you, no matter what type of fund you are, you do need to have um, a, a demonstrated story and demonstrated track record, right? So let's say within New Zealand as a venture fund, um, maybe you're doing something. I'm just going to throw an idea out there, like related to agriculture tech or maybe the space, um, the space sector, right? Because I know that's a emerging, um, growing tech, uh, growing space within uh, New Zealand. And if you can demonstrate like where you think the growth will be over the next 10 years, um, maybe your team of uh, partners are all scientists, um, uh, how you think this is scalable across the region or across the world, you know, have a story related to that that excites LPs. Um, and then related to that, maybe why, why you're unique um, and why only New Zealand can deliver on that um, so that LPs will feel like, oh, this is very different, right? Um, they'll feel like your fund or your um, portfolio is very different from anything else that they have so that they have to put money with you. Mm -hmm. Nice. Just opening it up for questions out to the floor there, please. Um, pop your questions in the Q&A section and um, we can ask them to the panel or to each panel member or, or to all of them. It'd be great. Do any of you panel members have any other points that you want to make on all of the bits and pieces that you've heard so far? Yeah, I, I'd love to add a little for um, Kiwi, uh, you know, uh, all the entrepreneurs in, in the chat that, that may be still contemplating. There's a tremendous amount of opportunities in Southeast Asia, and I understand the um, the view that, you know, it's, uh, let's go to Australia first, maybe the US, because a lot of Kiwi entrepreneurs are there, maybe it's Europe and the UK, but I think through, you know, building strong networks, like, you know, with the Edmund Hill Fellows coming to New Frontiers and our, our vet virtual webinars and summits, uh, through um, the Asia New Zealand Foundation and then perhaps through the impact collective, there's a lot of opportunities to build the network and the understanding of, you know, the, the Southeast Asia market and, and Asia Pacific in general. So that one day, if you feel that you'd like to expand your business here, there is actually a strong brand that New Zealand is recognized for. And then people not only appreciate the politics with the leadership, and, but also just the, you know, the amount of, investment that has been done to uh, the education industry that so many people are sending their kids here. Um, obviously tourism was, was big uh, and, the, and the food that is often you know renowned. Uh, and, and I think there is a lot of goodwill. There is a lot of opportunities. Um, I do find that uh, Kiwi entrepreneurs may feel that Asia is a little overwhelming. Uh, as you can see this, I, I work with a lot of Koreans. So this is um, Itaewon and this is like the 
concrete jungle uh, nightlife district, but uh, that's just something you have to get comfortable with. It's, you know, many different cultures, different languages, uh, and, and really just uh, enjoying and embracing it. And, and it will be a different pace. You know, there's no, no walk in the woods, no more a five minute walk to the ocean. And unfortunately, uh, and that's what I miss about uh, being here in Bangkok. Um, that said, uh, the, the spoils and the opportunities can be rewarded. But there is a lot of adaptation that you'll need to make as, as people, um, obviously with a lower um, level income or corporates that used to uh, buy, like use illegal software, they're not used to SaaS. They're not used to expensive implementations, uh, subscriptions, and they're not. Uh, and then consumers generally are, are going for free uh, and have different concerns, you know, maybe privacy is less so, and they want a product that is designed, suited, and localized to their needs. Um, and that is where, you know, having great business partners and communities to support and help you navigate through uh, these market entry points is so crucial. So, you know, have a look at some of the uh, communities that I mentioned, uh, and do keep this on your radar, because um, if it wasn't important, we wouldn't have be having this call. Thanks for that. A uh, question here from the floor. Given that it's a current recession, economic downturn, risk-taking decreases, what is the impact of the current crisis on investor interest in young IT startups versus mature startups? Um, I guess I'll take a crack at that as well. Um, I guess what, what there, I, I'm not quite sure exactly what's the, his definition of mature versus young startups. Um, <laughs> uh, younger startups, I think it's, uh, they're basically a different group of people looking at them. Um, the risk is obviously very different. What they need is different. The stage is different. Um, so you have different group of people looking at it. I think uh, in times like this, there are also a lot of opportunities as well. I think people see a lot of negative um, to, the, to the downside, but uh, we always see there, you know, there's also opportunities in times like this as well. So there are a lot of companies that are coming up today, particularly on online education, uh, like I mentioned before, sustainability, and vertical farming. Um, so that, that are coming up with really interesting ideas that are addressing some of these issues. Like in COVID testing, there are at least, as far as I know, probably 10, 20, if not more than that, uh, companies are focusing on that, doing vaccines, doing uh, antibodies. So there's a lot of stuff that's coming out uh, and investors are certainly taking notice and still focusing on that. Uh, as I mentioned, people still have liquidity. Um, so people are still looking to invest. Um, I would say mature, mature uh, startups, I guess if you mean like a unicorn startup that, are, uh, that have pretty large uh, valuations, but still probably not profitable. I think they're probably a little bit under more of a scrutiny. Um, people will be looking at how they are actually going to turn the profitability on instead of keep burning cash for the next two, three years for the foreseeable future. I think you see a lot of uh, mature VCs or, or mature startups probably aiming to go IPO sooner than they had planned than before. Um, so things will, things will change. Uh, the good companies, like I said, still get uh, the capital, but the medium or the mediocre companies uh, will certainly get a lot more pressure. Mm. Nice. I've got another question here. How do you see the risks of increased Asia regional or global backlash against CCP state capitalism and how it affects tech investing and broader global investment landscape? Debbie, you want to have a crack at that? Sure. Uh, just to clarify, CCP being like the communist government investing, Sorry. like the sovereign yeah, I assume okay. that's what Eric's put there. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, it's interesting. So, look, between the, without getting into politics, right, but between the US and China, um, the leadership obviously is taking this virus and then escalating it and adding, um, you know, dialogue back and forth, and it is concerning. Um, but there continues to be a lot of capital coming from Asian LPs and Chinese LPs and the China Sovereign Wealth Fund investing into US um, managers across strategies, across venture capital, growth capital, um, uh, uh, buyouts, et cetera. Is that gonna slow down? No, I haven't seen it slow down. 
Um, it's China capital is still very important to the world. Um, there are actually pretty interesting articles if you just search online on Bloomberg and um, uh, about these types of topics. Um, the capital also flows the other way, right? So a lot of U.S. Uh, public pension funds, so you can search for this online, um, or uh, university endowments out of the U.S. are big investors and big LPs in Chinese-based uh, managers as well, whether it's venture capital, uh, private equity, and etc. I think it's sensitive right now, um, but but you know the reality of two of the biggest markets for whatever industries and especially for the future of innovation. There's a lot of startups coming out of China and a lot coming out of the U.S. So LPs that have millions or billions to invest will continue to do so. It may slow down in the short term because of geopolitics, um, but I don't see them diverting it to other places because, again, these are the two largest economies. Mm, nice, thanks. Did that answer the question? Okay, all right. Yeah, Eric, yeah, Eric can, he can let us know if it hasn't quite got there. Um, any one, we've got time for one last question. Yep, here we've got one that's come in. Uh, indeed, Peter, constraints brought about COVID-19 are not shackles. I am heartened that EHF recognises that New Zealand has undervalued entities that can and must be optimised. Well done, great. <laughs> um, I'd, uh, I'd love to have just one kind of leaving piece from each of you that you'd love to leave the audience with? Um, maybe I'll go first. So uh, I'm, I'm making a big pitch here for Elevate. Uh, I hope all the, uh, you know, aspiring investors out there, including Amrit, can, you know, go and apply for Elevate to, to get the funding that they need to get, invest in more good companies uh, that will help the ecosystem in New Zealand, in New Zealand and the uh, rest of Asia. Nice, thanks. Debbie? I'll go next. Um, yeah, sure. So there always will be capital. So even with the current downturn, whether the recovery takes a year or two years or longer, there will always be capital that wants to find smart ideas, smart people. Um, consumer behavior is slightly shifting, right, because of work at home or social distancing. So a lot of the kind of sectors that Danny touched on could also be super interesting, even in the short term, if you've got an idea or a fund that fits into uh, online education or vaccines or whatever. So I think on the optimistic side, um, if you have something to offer that is unique, that is uh, either proven or at least you can give a good story, I think you can still raise money. Mm, I agree. Emera. Yeah, just leave a note. I guess it's not all doom and gloom. You know, uh, recently there's a blog um, post that I wrote inspired by another friend who said that you know some of the best companies are grown through the downturn. And uh, I think we hear that a lot. Uh, I certainly feel that I run a co-working space and we have uh, no, no space to operate because uh, of the partial lockdown. And, uh, social distancing is going to cut uh, occupancy by at least 50%. And we have to pivot. But that goes to show that you know these ideas that we said, we're going to do all these online programs, uh, were stuff that we had eight years ago. And we just never got around to it because we were so busy, you know, doing the same old things. And then it was a great time to pause, reflect, and, and strategize of how you've been doing business. Have you been applying too much effort for too little return? Is it, you know, is it making the impact that you wish it could? And a lot of new business models that now that weren't possible. And now is uh, in the past nobody would imagine all of us having these webinars we were clamoring to go to new zealand to be part of the new frontier summit uh but then unfortunately we can't and now this is the new normal and then we're on a webinar literally every day um, so i think besides that is there's going to be a massive um, glut of talent that's on the market and you know so many companies benefit from being able now to get the the ears of uh, engineer that has been furloughed or laid off and say, well, let's hack something together. There's a ton of hackathons and competitions and free accelerator programs like why why Combinator Startup School is amazing, tech stars anywhere. Uh, and, and you could literally build your company with all these free tools and get to a point where you start to get free grants and funding and then support. I think that whole piece and, and so many people focus on supporting 
the next wave, the next ventures, uh, our impact collective included. So we're really exciting to see if, you know, the next 10 years that we will be part of some exciting growth story, hopefully some coming out from New Zealand. Yeah, exactly. That's what we want. We want them coming out of New Zealand. Uh, thank you very much for your <laughs> time today. It's been great having you online with us. And please fill out the um, feedback form. And we've got other webinars that are coming up. And don't forget that cohort eight applications are open until um, June the 1st for late applications. And thank you very much, team. And we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.